When you look under the hood and you start looking at who is trading with whom, uh, what we do notice is that there is an increasing amount of trade that is being done between geopolitically close uh, countries uh, rather than across you know, some of these geopolitical blocks. This is especially notable after the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine war. The International Monetary Fund says the world could see significant swings in economic policy depending on the outcome of elections this year. It's just one of the messages in the IMF's most recent economic update, which I'm happy to unpack now with its chief economist, Pierre-Olivier Gouranchat. Pierre-Olivier, thank you so much for joining us today. Now, I have to say 2024 has already been a huge election year, but of course, all eyes now are on the US elections happening in, in November. When you and your colleagues warn about big potential swings in policy, what exactly do you mean? Well, thank you for, for having me, Katie. And uh, here, of course, 2024 was a year in, is a year in which we are having a lot of elections in many, many countries. And of course, one issue is that when you have uh, uh, elections like this, you can have also change in uh, economic policy packages. This is part of the process, of course. And that, from our perspective, this is potentially increasing economic policy uncertainty. And that uncertainty, in our view, is, is elevated at this point when we look at uh, potential outcomes going, uh, going forward. Forward. But having said this, in uh, uh, the report we just put out, what we're saying is a global economy that is remains fairly steady at this point. So growth, global growth is still around 3.2% for 2024. It's expected to increase very, very little to 3.3% by 2025. So we have a very steady and resilient global economy. What specific policies would worry you in the context of that growing uncertainty? Well, one issue is uh, that there can be an increase in, uh, you know, or maybe lack of progress, I would say, on some of the fiscal measures that need to be implemented. What we're seeing in a number of countries uh, is that after uh, years in which they've been hit by multiple crises, the COVID pandemic, then uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the associated surge in energy and food prices, what we're seeing is uh, fiscal buffers have been depleted in many countries. And so now is the time to start rebuilding them gradually, to do it credibly over time. And so efforts need to be put in place, measures need to be put in place to go in that direction. And there is a concern that maybe not enough will be done in, in coming years. So in, in concrete terms, does that mean that you're worried about governments spending too much money? Well, it's on. Uh, there are a number of reasons why debt dynamics uh, are going to become more challenging in, in years ahead. First, the debt levels themselves are more elevated. That's the consequence of the crisis that the countries have experienced. Second, uh, one uh, thing we flag in our report is medium-term growth prospects are uh, relatively uh, weak. Uh, I mentioned 3.2% growth rate overall for the global economy. That's well below the 3.8% we had between 2000 and 2019. So less growth means less tax revenues, for instance. And third, interest rates are still relatively high as central banks have been tightening monetary policy. So all of this creates an environment in which even with the same level of, uh, of uh, uh, fiscal deficits that countries may have had before, uh, that's just not enough. So a little bit more effort is needed for, for many countries. And, and how should governments kickstart growth if, if they don't have a, a lot of um, monetary playroom? Well, this is where it's important to be to be very targeted. I mean, of course, there are some very important uh, uh, expenditures that need to be maintained. Uh, you know, you need uh, to educate the population. You need to the public, uh, pub build public infrastructure in many countries. You need to invest in some of the challenges that uh, countries are also facing, whether it's climate or national security or, or energy security. So all of these things are things that need to be addressed. And so some efforts need to be made in terms of making sure that there is enough uh, domestic domestic revenue uh, mobilization, for instance, enough, enough tax revenues that are collected, which in many countries that can be improved. For instance, uh, a number of countries have relatively low levels of tax collection. Uh, in other countries, it's, it's more about targeting, where you target some of the public expenditures uh, rather than maybe uh, uh, thinking about raising tax revenues. So some of these efforts need to be done along multiple fronts. Now, one interesting point made in this report is that while trade in general is expected to stay pretty steady, trade between geopolitically distant blocks is expected to diminish. Can you give me some examples of relationships you expect to be strengthened and diminished as a result of this trend?
Well, when we're looking, there, there are two things here that I would like to flag. One is that overall, when we're looking at the global volume of trade, uh, at, again, at the global level, it's been doing pretty well, and it's, it, it will be growing at a fairly good rate this year. And in a sense, the trade to GDP, the ratio of the volume of trade to economic activity is uh, fairly stable. So that's, that's kind of good news. We're not seeing the volume of trade collapsing. We're not seeing uh, uh, the level of uh, exchanges, international exchanges, decreasing uh, uh, dramatically. It's actually holding fairly steady. But when you look under the hood and you start looking at who is trading with whom, uh, what we do notice is that there is an increasing amount of trade that is being done between what we call geopolitically close uh, countries uh, rather than across you know, some of these geopolitical blocks. So the trade between geopolitical blocks has been decreasing. The trade within geopolitical blocks has been, has been increasing. This is especially notable after the beginning of uh, the uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine war. In concrete terms, are you talking about the strengthening of alliances like BRICS? Or can you give me some examples of the countries that you're talking about who are, are developing closer ties and at the expense of which relationships? Well, we're seeing certainly an increase in, in a decrease in trade, for instance, there is a decrease in bilateral trade, uh, obviously, between directly between some countries in the West and, and, for instance, Russia. There is a decrease in bilateral trade between uh, the United States and China. But what we're seeing, and this is the, the, the this is why also at the same time, the global trade has not been changing too much, is some of this trade has been replaced by what we call connector uh, uh, tr country trade. So trade that would go maybe directly from, say, China to the US, goods that would be exported directly from China to the US, now may be going through some of these connector countries, or some of the stages of production might be moved to some of these connector countries, whether these are some of the Asian countries, countries like Vietnam, for instance, or some of it could be actually also going through uh, Latin American countries, countries like Mexico, for instance. If the overall trade volume is continuing at a decent momentum, though, from the perspective of ordinary workers and consumers, does it really matter if that trade takes place within more politically aligned blocks? Well, it can matter, and and this is one of the things we've been uh, worried about. I mean, of course, if you start having a decrease in trade volumes, that would be something that could be associated with loss in efficiency of productions, increasing costs, and therefore increasing the price of the goods that are being imported. It can also lead to a slower transfer of technology. If you have less trade, you have le less transfer of technology between countries, and that, of course, is is impacting the ability of countries to grow. Now, even if we have this trade through connector countries, if we have, in a sense, we have the supply chains that are getting more elongated, they are not necessarily becoming more resilient. There are more nodes in the chain, and therefore there are more potential for choke, choke points. You mentioned technology there. Now, China's Communist Party is holding a big conference this week where the idea of achieving technological independence is high on the agenda. Here in the West, we hear a lot about attempts to de-risk or decouple relations with China. But is it fair to say that Beijing is now doing the same thing in the other direction? Well, there's certainly a sense in which the uh, Chinese uh, uh, authorities have been moving in, in the same direction. For instance, we can point to China 2025, which was uh, uh, stated uh, about 10 years ago to, in 2015, uh, as an objective to try to limit the uh, dependence of uh, the China's economy on a certain number of imports. In the sense, uh, we see other countries trying to do the same thing with China at the same time. So some of these efforts, we see them uh, across different countries. And certainly, this is something there is a there is a legitimate uh, notion of economic security. Countries have to be uh, sure that they are not vulnerable on some of the critical components of their supply chain. But that has to be done in a way that, in a sense, uh, is, is very carefully calibrated. Uh, there is uh, too often there is uh, the potential behind some of these measures to be some form, to be protecting some form of local interests or to be some form of hidden protectionism. And that would be something that would be uh, hurtful for the global economy and the individual countries rather than helping them. Let's remember that, for instance, the 2018-2019 tariffs that were imposed by the US against uh, China, uh, most of the studies that we've seen uh, indicate that the, the costs of these tariffs were borne uh, in large part by the U.S. consumers. And therefore, some of these, some of these measures also have, have a very significant cost.
I want to focus on another part of the world now, and that is sub-Saharan Africa. Your latest outlook has revised Sudan's growth prospects down 16% uh, due to the ongoing conflict there. Where does this part of the world factor into these shifting geopolitical alliances? Well, uh, we do have a, a revision in some of the sub-Saharan African, you mentioned Sudan. We have also a downward revision in, in Nigeria, and that's related to uh, lower than expected oil production in the first uh, quarter uh, of the year. Now, this is certainly a region where there's been a certain amount of political instability in recent years. Uh, and, and some of the, these countries are facing very difficult challenges. I mean, they have a very, very limited fiscal buffers. We were talking about fiscal policy earlier. Uh, they, there is a need for them to uh, raise uh, uh, more revenues of very significant spending needs as well, uh, especially for uh, vulnerable segments of the population when it comes to basic necessities. Uh, and they are in a situation where they have elevated uh, debt levels to start with. So it's a very complex, very complex environment that they have to navigate. And of course, uh, to the extent we can, the, the, the IMF is, is, is engaging with countries in this region and try to help them figure out a way to uh, stimulate growth and, and at the same time address some of the fiscal, the fiscal uh, difficulties. And what advice would you be giving to these countries? Well, one of the key advice there would be that uh, it's very important to promote uh, macroeconomic stability. And macroeconomic stability is the bedrock upon which uh, countries can really uh, can really grow and develop. So, having having uh, a, a good institutional framework, having uh, uh, as transparent as possible and as uh, 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 you know efficient as possible fiscal system, having a monetary policy that uh, is is predictable, that is uh, is also very clear and helps anchor uh, inflation expectations. Those are key ingredients that will, uh, for most countries in the world, actually all countries in the world, will be, uh, will be a key component for their economic success. Now, when I was reading this report, I was really struck by how often fossil fuels were mentioned. There seems to be no let up in demand for oil and gas. Last week, in fact, energy giant BP raised its forecast for oil and gas demand. Is the cold hard truth here that much of the growth that will happen in the next few years is still going to be powered by dirty energy? Well, we we have uh, we've had uh, oil prices that have been fluctuating in the seventy five dollars to ninety dollars range uh, so far this year, and uh, here we have a combination of two forces at play. On the, on the one hand, demand is 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 in fact. Uh, um, you know, the demand has been has been robust, but you know, not really increasing uh, very very quickly. One of the things that has been supporting oil prices is really the uh, the cuts in production coming from OPEC plus countries. So we are in a situation where oil prices remain substantial, but in part on the back of uh, of cuts in production. Now, going forward, what we anticipate is that, in fact, as some of these uh, uh, oil price cuts lapse and 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 uh, demand continues, but uh, at its modest pace, uh, oil prices are expected to come down uh, moderately over the year. The big question I think you're asking is more about the medium term. If we're looking at the medium term, uh, what can we expect in terms of oil demand? And here, there's a lot of uncertainty, but I think really what we should all realize is that it will be very much a function of the uh, path we take in terms of the climate transition. Uh, and uh, we are seeing already very good signs. For instance, in 2023, we've had a, a, a phenomenal increase in uh, in, in, new, in renewable uh, energy uh, production capacity installed in advanced economies uh, and also in China. The, the countries that are uh, lagging behind uh, on, on, on that front are, are emerging, other emerging and developing countries. But what we're seeing in advanced economies in China is a, is, is a really very rapid ramp up in the installation of uh, renewable energy capacity. And I think if we continue on that pace and we can bring in uh, emerging and other emerging and developing countries, then we could see very well that there could be a decrease in the demand for, uh, for fossil fuels going forward. And that's certainly the path that we should be uh, making all our efforts to, to embark on. How do protectionist policies play into the green transition, though? <laughs> 
Well, they're certainly not helping, uh, and, and 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 here this is something that we looked at carefully. I mean, one of the one of the reason uh, uh, that uh, this can be complicated by the 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 rise in uh, in industrial policy measures or 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 trade measures, trade restricting measures that we've seen in the last few years. And let me remind uh, your audience that these have absolutely exploded. We have in excess of three thousand uh, new trade restricting measures that have been Im imposed in 2023. There was only one thousand in 2019. And 2019 was not a low uh, a year, in fact. Uh, so these these measures have really in increased a lot. Now, where can this bite when we're thinking about the climate transition? Well, it can bite, especially when we're thinking about uh, some of the critical minerals uh, and some of the commodities that are needed to produce uh, batteries, to produce solar panels. And some of the studies we've, we've conducted show that the more we go uh, towards this uh, geoeconomic fragmentation, the more it will delay delay the investment in uh, renewables, the investment or the capacity to scale up, if, for instance, in electric vehicles, producing batteries, etc. So certainly not a good news. OK, so less protectionism, a quicker energy transition. Pierre-Olivier Grandchat, Chief Economist at the IMF, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you.